Andreas. All right. So I'm Sebastian. To be clear, not the Babel guy. He's tomorrow, so you're stuck with me today. Um, it's the source of confusion. But I'm, I'm the older one. He's the younger one. He's coming tomorrow. So hello, Bob. Um, it's pretty hot in here. You guys hot? Wow. Yeah. It's the last talk of the day for uh, the lightning talks. Uh, I hope everyone is like feeling a little bit still awake because it's going to be fairly technical. Um, but it's not going to be anything important. So if you like fall asleep, it's not. It's not ended well. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my perspective of, of what the React tool chain is and what React's role in our uh, general tool chain is. Um, let's start by looking at this simple example of a React view, right? This is a pretty reasonable example. It's not, it's not a real world example or anything. It's not, it's not as real world as um, uh, Hello World or um, Ryan's examples, but this is pretty simple use case and almost all of our demos we've seen today look something like this but my goal of this talk is to make this look really silly um, either that or make myself look really silly for saying that but we'll see so when react was first introduced this was the way we saw the world that html was this center of our world uh, the dom was the center of our world but as we're integrating more and more things with React and we're porting more and more of our applications to React, this view has sort of flipped around. So the way I see React now is that React is the center and the DOM is actually just an implementation detail of React. And this seems a little bit arrogant coming from me because I'm a core contributor to React, but I'll try to explain why. So start with the basics. What, what's your job as a UI developer? What exactly is it that you're building, right? It's probably not a cool sorting algorithm or something like that, right? It's, that's generally not what we do. What we do is take existing abstractions, compose them with another abstraction, and create a third abstraction, right? Like, it's figuring out all these pieces that go into an application, all these puzzles, and figuring out what abstractions go together with other abstractions, and when to use an abstraction and not to use an abstraction. This is an art form. So this is what React is good for. It's a toolbox for this. It allows us to create these reusable components. So we can create this link component, for example, that um, takes an href for maybe some children or passes in the class and extends it with another class. Um, but to me, this is a little bit scary because if you pass a class name straight through and, and add it, that class name could just override anything. There's no encapsulation here. The, the class of the CSS can override anything in the component. But what if we did something like this? We pass in a single flag instead of passing a whole class. And this is one of the powerful features on composition that is actually in, unlike what inheritance allows you to do. Composition allows you to do smaller, limited APIs. It allows us to limit the surface area. We don't have to pass every DOM property as part of our API to a component, right? We can limit what we expose. And this is a really powerful feature because uh, it allows less flexibility from the outside, but a stronger contract allows more flexibility on the inside. So for example, this is, would be trivial to port this implementation to, to React Native, for example, right? You can create another link component for React Native, and then everyone that uses these link components will just work on React Native as well. So this is the key to composition. It allows you to create these more refined uh, abstractions. And then you can combine these components with other components and building out our toolbox, right? This is nothing new to you guys, but. Of course, you may not use this particular ones, but that's the art form, right? You, you, you learn, you iterate, you choose which ones to use and which components are needed. And that's what React is all about. It's, it's not an out of the box UI library. It's not a virtual DOM library, just allowing you to, to write the DOM. It's, about, it's a tool for building out your toolbox of tools, right? Your toolbox of components. And once you do that, you open up a lot of flexibility. One of the common requests we get for React is just, why don't we have a plugin system for events, for example? Why don't we have, uh, make it extensible so you can add new attributes as you want? Well, the problem with that is that 
if you have a global configuration system, you undermine the ecosystem. So like, if you guys implement one component, you guys implement it in a different way, and we try to share them in the same application, in the same React tree, now we have a problem because you might have conflicting configurations. So we want to make sure that uh, components are isolated, similarly to how NPM packages are isolated from each other. Right? We have, need to have a strong contract between components. But if you implement your own toolbox, and you implement your own local level of components, this shouldn't be a problem to you because if you need to extend, have extra attributes, extra events, a, a custom event system that doesn't follow React's model, you can just do that by implementing it into your lower level set of components and they will still work with other components within the page. And you don't need to wait for this to be part of components or, or part of React because they're part of your toolbox, right? This is a tool for building your toolbox. But you can run into custom, problem with custom components as well. Um, if we have this permalink, for example, and we want to maybe tweak it, we have a new requirements. We used to use this as a composition of another link component. Now we have some new requirements. We don't really know how to, to solve it. So now it's the time to like do some clever hack or work around it or compose it with another component. But, or we can go one level deeper. This is another important um, insight into like the component model, that you don't just have to build upwards, you can sometimes drill downwards. If you don't have a better option, skip the abstraction, fork it, and do what you need to, where it makes sense, right? It's not your job to come up with clever hacks of, to work around the Robin abstraction. It's, it's, it's about to pick the right level of abstraction fork from that point on, and then build new abstractions on top of it, compose them, right? The right level of abstraction, not the wrong level of abstraction. But of course, the DOM is our lower, lower level primitive. Uh, if that anchor tag doesn't do what we want, well, we're, we're, we're screwed, right? We can't go lower than the DOM. That's our world, it's our whole world view. Everything builds around the DOM. Well, the DOM kind of sucks. Um, the problem is, the DOM is a terrible target for functional programming. Um, we've done the best we can with what we have, and we created these different algorithms and all these cool abstractions like the virtual DOM and all this stuff, right? But if we didn't have to use the DOM as our target, if we, had, if we could design it in a different way, we wouldn't use the DOM. I'll try to explain why. One question that I often get asked is, why don't we just like, make React pass through attributes? It's just an attribute, I just want to set it. Well, the problem is that that's not how the DOM was designed. The DOM is designed around attributes and the properties. So attributes represents the serialized view of the world, the value at the start when you load the page, and then that becomes an imperative model. And after that point in time, that same value is represented as a property over time. And it's not the same to set an attribute as it is to set a property. It's not just a pass through. Uh, because an attribute basically changed the serialized representation of what the view was at the start of the application. It's, it's not what it, the application is now. So if we do some diffing, in this example I have, on the, on the left side I have the two inputs, and I want to diff them against each other, and I see that there's this checked attribute that gets added. So a naive implementation of a virtual DOM was just set the attribute checked. That, that works until someone actually checks the checkbox and after that point on, this attribute won't be updated anymore. That's not how attributes work. Attributes is, is a part of the serialization model. And they were never meant to be used as an imperative API for changing the value over time. They're just part of the serialization. So to do this, to make this work in the React model, we have to use the property input.checked equals true to, to make a mutation to the DOM. So it's not a simple uh, pass-through model. But more importantly, not all of these properties are even declarative. They're like play and pause. There, there's no, it's currently playing. So the DOM API isn't even exposed in the declarative form. Um, so we have to do some magic on top of this to be exposed a declarative model. And that, that is part of what React does. Um, and another problem is, uh, how the diffing algorithm works. So an example is, is children in style, which we do a lot of things in React to, to diff them. We, we have this missing, diffing algorithm, right, that compares two set of children, 
and then figures out the mutations that have to do to the DOM to, to make the, uh, the mutation happen, right? Similarly, for styles, we take two different style objects and we compare them and we see what mutations we have to apply. So the way we implement the diffing algorithm can be implemented in many different ways and there's many different trade-offs there. So there's ver various virtual DOM libraries that have uh, chose uh, different trade-offs. For example, you can uh, use an algorithm to solve the longest common subsequence uh, problem, which allows you to solve more edge cases, but some common cases are, are a little bit slower. So there's, there's a bunch of trade-offs there, but, but you shouldn't even have to do any of this stuff, right? The only reason we have to do that is because these particular data structures are implemented in C++ in the browser model as this completely different data structure that it's not natural to JavaScript for functional programming. Um, so a much simpler model would be, even if we use mutation, right, what if the data model in the DOM looked something like this? Just replace the children. It's a single pointer update. That's how simple it should be. And React has to work around all this problem because we're targeting the DOM and because the DOM doesn't have a better API surface area for, for this. Another thing is that you have several side effects and mashup components can mess with DOM, uh, the diffing algorithm, for example. A lot of you has probably noticed that if you render it into document.body, someone will screw that up uh, because there's gonna be some mashup script or some Chrome extension or whatever that's it's gonna change the DOM underneath you and, and React isn't, isn't aware of what, what's happening underneath. Uh, and, and, and it can go the other way as well, that React is making changes um, at various points in time, but it chooses when to make those changes. For example, it's on a previous talk that um, there's this notion of the transaction and when we're doing the changes isn't necessarily when you hit set state, right? And, and we wanna move, do more with that. We wanna be able to take advantage of the declarative model to do the changes when it's most suitable for the system to do the change. But if your system that targets something within the DOM and queries something in the DOM is trying to read from the DOM at the same time, that at, at specific times, then we have to uh, accommodate that. So we, we would like it to ideally be non-observable when we do this mutation from other code, or at least that have a different plugin system that extensions can do to extend the React DOM. The web components was, of course, going to save us from everything in the DOM world. Fortunately, not. Um, it does nothing to enforce any kind of declarative APIs at all, um, which means that it's impossible to automatically map just uh, a React-like API to a web components API, because a lot of web components are actually implemented that, with the assumption that you're going to target them with an imperative API. So you will always have to add some kind of translation layer like the one I showed before for your web components. But now instead of, of doing it once for some DOM stuff that we do in React, you have to do it for every web component to, that you consume, right? And th this is not something we can solve automatically for you because it's a different programming model. Um, there's also a bunch of un unsolved uh, componentization issues with regard to tables and stuff like that. There's a very complex model for children that is much simpler in React. It, it totally punts on the event system for interop between frameworks. You can, th there's ways to work around event delegation that React has, but there's no way to make different frameworks that use event delegation to, to talk to each other, right? There, that's an unsolved problem. Um, and it has the same overhead of marshalling that, that of uh, C++ data structures that we have in the regular DOM. So it doesn't solve any of these problems. They're, they're, they are all there. All the problems we have with the DOM are still there for web components. But what if we could do something different? What, what would be the ideal for us as the React community and, and for the React framework? Let's take a look at, uh, at what the stack looks like today. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with like how the browser works underneath, but basically we have React in the bottom here talking to the DOM API or the CSS OM, which is the object model for CSS, um, which is an imperative API on top of the HTML and CSS model that was originally created um, for the web, right? Then that model uh, gets translated into a box tree, which is where the layout happens. Uh, the box tree is basically, if you have text flow that can be broken down into multiple boxes, but everything in your DOM tree 
gets represented as some kind of box that is going to end up being on the screen. And then these boxes uh, combine into graphics layers and, and they get uh, drawn and composited on, onto the GPU. Does that make sense? Um. No. <laughs> no. Maybe I should just ask, take a question or two about this before we go on because it's kind of important to understand the, the model. Anyone have, have any questions? Super clear to everyone. Awesome. Um, so what if we could bypass the imperative API of the DOM altogether? So this is an idea that I was exploring earlier this year. What if we had a functional way to talk to the DOM? What if we had a virtual DOM in the browser itself? Not as a layer on top of the DOM, but as an equal partner of the DOM. Unfortunately, I think this might be too radical. Um, at least right now, it seems like a lot of browser implementers are not willing to take on that kind of tasks. If they were to implement a virtual DOM, they would probably build it on top of the existing imperative API, which would leave them with the same kind of problems we already have, so we wouldn't be in a better state than we have with React today. So that's not really better. And, and the reason for this is that it turns out that the HTML model and the CS model, because there was only one DOM, has been very tightly coupled inside of the browser. So these C++ APIs are, are integrated in the browser implementations. And we all know how hard it is to, for, to work in legacy code bases. So like, I'm, I'm not uh, blaming the browser implementer for this. Like, they have a big hurdle uh, ahead of them, right? Living with this ancient API. Um, but what they really do right now is try to figure out how to explain what is already there. Expose more APIs of, of the browser that's already implemented. And that's what the extensible web manifesto is all about. And that's really good because it, it allows us lower level access to what is already there. And we don't have to ask them to embrace a completely new model like React, for example. Okay, so we can't talk directly to HTML and CSS model, but I don't really like CSS and HTML that much anyway. I hate end up in, in a CSS blog where someone does something clever, like here's how you create a circle in pure CSS. And I appreciate the cleverness, and it's really smart, but you're working around a problem that, is, that you're lacking basic functionality. Like creating this circle is, is it's like primary school math, right? Like we, we know how to do that. Um, and if we had lower level primitives, we could easily do that ourselves, and we wouldn't have to figure out all these clever hacks, and we wouldn't have to go out to conferences to learn about all these weird hacks. Um, and meanwhile, the, the design that I was asked by my designer to implement is a lot more complicated than a few circles, and it's a lot more involved, and it's a lot more custom layouts, and it, it might need custom drawing capabilities. So CSS is not always the right abstraction, right? We want to have the right abstraction for the right job. So we, sometimes we have to go lower. And this is what Houdini is all about. I'm, I'm not talking about the, the magician that pretended to be French, but the CSS working group standard. Has anyone heard of this? So basically the idea of this working group is to figure out how to expose APIs into that can surface what is already into the browser, what is already in the CSS model, right? And how can we read and manipulate the layout and the drawing primitives that are already in the browser. This is it's really cool work. So one API is to expose the box tree. So with something like that, what if we could make React components that bypasses the HTML model completely and talk directly to the layout mm -hmm. system? You could even write your own HTML-like model, not in terms of, of DOM elements, not in terms of web components, but completely from scratch, right? In a React model as a React component while still allowing our, DOM, our other DOM to fully interact with this layout system because it's, it's exposing what is already there in the browser. But w what is in there in the browser? It's this magic black box that we think is really complicated and really magical. Well, actually, Chris implemented the most important parts of it with uh, CSS layout, right? It's what we use for React Native. It's powering a lot of really complicated apps. So we've seen that it's powerful enough to do a lot of things. And what if we could just use that for React, integrate it into React, 
and, and make it part of how you build components, how your components flow, how you get layout information as part of, of the, your React components. Well, maybe we don't even meet the box tree. We could just talk directly to the graphics layers. And we hit similar issues as the DOM with, with React Native, with UIKit and the Android view system. So maybe even those view systems should be second class to the React component model. For a lot of things, we can just target the graphics layers directly, even on these native platforms. But you know, even the graphics layers, like the layer of subtraction of creating these rectangles and, and, and textures and, and what gets painted on all of them, even they are not really well suited for some use cases, for example, embedding 3D models or making cool motion blur effects within the layout or having one uh, layer blur another layer or things like that. But you know, React is just a generic component model. It works for a lot of programming models. It's, it's a way of, of writing code. It's not tied to the DOM necessarily and definitely not tied to graphics layers. So what if we just go all the way to the GPU? What if we build WebGL components using React? Of course, we need to integrate, right? That's what being a good citizen and, and, and iterated uh, system is all about, right? We need to cooperate with the system around us. So it may be that React renders to any one of these layers. Maybe it's a combination of them. Maybe we target DOM for some things. We embed box tree inside of other things. We use graphics layers for certain uh, complex subtrees. We add special effects for embedded within our other components. But the point is that you should be able to have the option to use the right layer for the right job. And React is not just a virtual DOM library. React is a component model for abstractions. It's for building your toolbox of components. And as long as you can build those up from the lower level primitives, you don't necessarily need what is in the DOM. You can go beyond the DOM. So let's take a look at this example again. Hopefully this looks a little bit more silly. Why, why is this person that wrote this example so obsessed with the DOM? It's all DOM tags everywhere, the style sheets, the class names. There's this rail thing, whatever that is. Uh, why is there a role here in my view? Uh, it's just a button, right? So maybe something like this would be more appropriate. Maybe this is how we should be building our views, something more high level. Maybe not just these components, these particular components. And building up what primitives we need is not easy. Like, we don't know. That's, it took a lot of time to build the HTML. But, you know, we are the best people to say which components we need not the W3C or not what people thought would be the best abstractions to build your views with 20 years ago or more, right? We have a community and we've done this with React Native, for example. We, React Native is essentially a set of small low-level UI components that are not DOM related. But, and they solve a lot of use cases. They're accessible, they, they don't have the problem of not having accessibility because it uses the, the native accessibility tools. And it's a built, set of built-in touch-friendly UI components, but that doesn't cover every use case, right? We have a, a great community, and we can cr cover a lot of use cases. We already have a bunch of awesome UI libraries. They all build core components. In fact, it would be a pretty cool startup idea if you guys are looking for a job um, to just create UI components for React. Like, what if someone just build an enterprise component library, right? Enterprise apps has very different uh, requirements than we have. They build a lot of forms, the same forms over and over again. And they, they want to have kind of re reusability of those components. If you build a rich consumption experience like Flipboard or Paper or something like that, you have very different needs. You need a different kind of set of lower level components, sorry. So I'll leave you this, this little small challenge can you build an app using only a component library without putting a single DOM tag in there? Or maybe just a few primitives. And what primitives would you need to build your app if you didn't have the DOM? What would be the ideal primitives to build your app if you didn't think about the DOM? Thank you. So we have some time for questions. It doesn't have to be about this. It can be about React in general, create class, make sense, whatever, context. Do you need that at some point? 
So the question is, do you think that React will at some point be just pure AST and not tied to DOM or browser implementation? Then actually, <coughs> actually yes. Um, that's what React 014, the next release of React, is going to be all about. Uh, it was a nice setup uh, for, for me to explain that part. Basically, what we're turning React, the package, the NPM package into, is just a way for you to describe what your components look like. And components in components. And when you create a component, that's what you describe. But there's no dependencies to where that thing is going to be rendered. Then we're separating the renderer and how components gets rendered into a separate package. And you can use your own. You can try to optimize your own situation and like, see if you can do better than we can. You probably can. Um, and, or you can render it to a different environment. And we want to be able to create what I call isomorphic, but I'm not supposed to call them. Where's Michael? I'm supposed to call them universal components. Um, basically, the idea of a universal component is that it's a component that has multiple branches. And you could choose, depending on which environment it is, which one it's going to render into. It's, it's sort of like media queries for components. Um, and if you build all your components based on universal components, then now you can move your top-level app state and your top-level reusable components between environments, like specific ones for iOS, specific ones for Android, specific ones for, for web. Um, and, and if you have the ability to render to WebGL, maybe you use a WebGL component. If you have the capability to render uh, to DOM, then maybe you choose that. If you have an accessibility target, maybe you choose a different output that is easier to make accessible. Right? So it, it's, it's all about having these low-level components being able to render to different environments, but also have the implementation of React itself be flexible and, and swappable. So that be, then the React components become what you're explaining. It's basically uh, just a description, just a specification of, of what React components should be able to render to. So the question is if it's going to get rid of the requirement that we have to return exactly one um, element instead of, for example, multiple elements from a renderer. Yes, that's, that's a long-standing task. Um, this is basically tied to the implementation details of React and like making sure that we decouple those things from the rest of the React. Uh, it's part of the way it's taken a long time to do that, figuring out where to, to cut the edges of React, what is the specification for what React should be able to provide. But now that we have that, we have a, a much easier uh, road ahead of us to change the implementation details of React. And one of those implementation details is just how we talk to the DOM. And currently, that becomes very difficult to implement what you're, you're asking for, because you can return multiple DOM elements from a single composite component. And currently, we have a one-to-one -one mapping in the internals. But there's nothing in our model that says we have to do it that way. It might be a good way to, to, uh, to structure your app anyway, because it can be confusing when one com uh, component expands to multiple components if, uh, as a consumer of, of that component. But we will, should definitely have the flexibility of allowing that. Yes. What's the craziest rendering target you could imagine for React? The craziest rendering target. I think we saw it earlier today. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think the GPU is is pretty crazy, um, <laughs> but. Crazy is usually where good ideas start, so maybe it could be something cool. What features or APIs are you excited about in the, say, medium term for React? Um, so what features am I excited about for uh, immediate term for React? I'm uh, pretty excited about some kind of uh, sideways data subscription model. Um, generally, I, I tend to prefer having fully immutable trees, and I trade T tend to prefer that have my all my um, data coming from above, sort of the the relay model or sort of pure React model without subscriptions. But there's a lot of cases where y you want to be able to pass some kind of ID or some kind of representation of a data, 
but couple that data to uh, data fix, uh, external data fiction models. For example, if, if we were to build, rebuild the HTML world, how would you implement the image tag? Well, currently you have to rely on lifecycle methods and maybe if the URL changes, what do you do? Uh, currently what, what happens is that if you change the URL, the previous image gets stored, uh, gets stored while you're loading the new image. So you have to store the old value just so that you can show the old value while the new value loads and it's actually really complicated. Um, and you, you have to f remember to clean that up, right? As you unmount, you have to make sure that you clean up any resources that you depend on. And that's, that's, that's a lot of imperative work that we have to do right now. So I'm excited about having a declarative model for uh, expressing the data dependencies that are not falling from the top down. So what should other frameworks steal from React and what can React learn from other frameworks? So um, I, I think that uh, a lot of the other frameworks are, are focusing a lot on, on templating and, and languages. I think React model of just using a single generic language for this, maybe it's not even JavaScript, but wh whatever it is, right? Make it expressible, let people learn the capabilities of a generic language instead of a domain specific language. I think um, that's something that other frameworks use to differentiate themselves, but uh, I, I think they're, they're fooling themselves in the long term. Um, what React can you learn, actually, what I look a lot at is OM um, and ClojureScript. Um, in a lot of ways, they're ahead of the, the curve there. They're, they have a lot more flexibility. They're, they, they're fully embracing the pro functional programming model so they, they can do shortcuts that we can't do. Um, they're also thinking a lot about the full stack, so their, their data uh, storage services, their, their relay stuff, and Omnex is really cool. Um, so I, I think we, there's a lot we can learn from them. Oh, so what is the plan for server-side rendering? Um, uh, Yahoo is, is really interested in this, and they're, they're starting to, to think about uh, contributing a little bit more. Um, so that's, that's really awesome. Uh, the, the thing we're doing with 14 is extracting the renderer from the definition. So there will actually be different packages for server-side render to markup as opposed to DOM client-side rendering. And that allows us to optimize both the server-side rendering and the client-side rendering separately. For example, we currently use HTML to do client-side rendering, but we might not want to do that in modern browsers. Actually, it's probably much slower now than it, uh, in modern browsers than it used to be in older browsers. So we want to change the implementation details of the client. But more importantly, we can also do optimizations for the server-side specific use case. So opening up that uh, possibility and, and we've structured the, the folder structure inside of React Core to do a lot more um, server-side specific optimizations there. Um, we're not using it as heavily at Facebook right now, which is why we're not investing heavily in it, but uh, I think that's an area we will continue to explore. So the question is what, what I think about components that um, trigger side effects by, by calling callbacks um, based on some other input than just UI elements, for example, a timer or something like that. I, I think that's, um, that's an important use case. Uh, you can use that for abstraction. It might be a little bit of a hack, but um, with sideways data loading and event uh, subscriptions, maybe there could be 
other ways of expressing that capability. Um, w but however we do that, it's, I think it's really important that React is able to, to control and throttle those events because what we want to do in the future is have more control over when things happen. You really use the declarative model to optimize performance in a systematic way. So one problem that we see at Facebook is that we, we develop at scale, right? We have a lot of developers, a lot of people. So, and when that happens, it tends to be slower apps. You probably notice this yourself. If you implement an app yourself from scratch, it's going to be faster than if you have 10 people implementing the same app because everyone goes in their, their own direction. Um, and every, the problem is that everyone wants to optimize their own feature, right? And those optimizations can take out each other sometimes. Um, so you end up making the whole application s slower. So one lesson we've learned is we want to be able to systemize those trade-offs. We want to be able to have the system choose wh what to optimize and what to do first, what, what to, to, to do later. Um, we've done this with our packaging system, for example. We don't choose ourselves which order our packages are going to get loaded. We have a machine learning algorithm that figures out when they're going to be learn, uh, loaded. We have no human interaction that figures out, oh, I, my code is more important than your code, so I'm going to put it here. Right? The, the machine will figure out based on use case and based on, on usage data which is the most important one. So that, that's, a, that's a capability where we have to be careful about uh, imperative side effects. Yes, Dan. So is some kind of side loading going to get checked into the next version of React? I think not. Not at the 14. Uh, we're probably going to do a quick process. Uh, succession with 15. Uh, maybe the version after that, there's still some unsolved uh, questions and a lot of, of uh, controversy, and we'll, we don't want to jump the gun because like, you can already solve this in, in the user space. You just want to make sure that we have a declarative model to express this so that we can create a systematic use case of this. Um, and, and to do that, we have to make it, we have to do it right. Okay, this is going to be the last question. I'm going to give it to you. Will React be using semantic versioning? So will React be using semantic versioning? Um, yeah, we, we try to do that, with like, um, but the problem is that we're in on the zero range, so it, it's not um, as good as it should be. Um, we're thinking about sort of jumping into the, the higher range, like 1.0, 2.0, or, or 10 or something. Um, to allow another version, uh, another minor version, so that we can do uh, more fine-grained releases. Um, but one issue I see with that is that we have a community that is moving towards a lot more client-side JavaScript. We have a huge discussion in, in the community now if we should be really building all these client-side apps or we should be building server-side apps that send HTML over and CSS over uh, and, and allow, uh, allow browsers, especially mobile ones, to not download so much JavaScript. But the, the problem with that is like there's so much benefit in having the client-side model, and the native model is, is seeing that. The difference is that they can reuse a lot more. They have better cache systems. They have uh, equivalents to service workers where you can have fine-grained uh, fine control over the resources you download. Um, and if we want to move to a model where we download more resources and have larger frameworks, we're going to find a way to share them. And if we have something like WordPress, which is like 23% of the market, right? <coughs> if, if most of them use the same version, then the cost of downloading JavaScript, if it can be cached and shared in a proper way and pre-warmed in a proper way, uh, is, is going to be more important. So I think we'll move to, in as a community, we will move towards uh, not as fast iteration speed of frameworks so that m many different websites can reuse the same CDNs, for example. Um, because otherwise, you will, you will start having problems uh, with where all our JavaScript goes out of um, too much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>